Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Um, so here's the other one that I think is really interesting. I mentioned the ULI Emerging Trends earlier. Uh, this is a great report. It's probably the most read industry report in our industry on commercial real estate. And so what I did is I've read it about three times and I still have only grasped about 75, 80% of it. So you have to read it multiple times. But here are the five key points that I put on this slide 18 and the two big ones that are at the top and the bottom. So the number one thing that permeated every ULI investor and, and, and respondent in the, in the report this year said was buyers and sellers cannot agree on pricing. That's your biggest challenge, James, uh, and your agents and your investors is you know, how are you going to get buyers and sellers closer together to make transactions? And so all of these skills that you teach and these continuing education and webinar things, we're going to have to go dust off old uh, skills on how you get sellers to accept reality and how you get buyers to realize, well, there may not be this asset type. If you want to invest in it, you may have to come a little bit towards the middle. And the last one at the bottom there is the sugar rush is over that property returns, um, a right for reset. And that's the valuation that we've just been talking about. Um, the values have to change when you look at the cost of capital has doubled. And when the cost of capital doubles, the cap rate changes and the value changes. So those, and yet nobody believed the Fed can navigate this thing without a recession. Um, and so, uh, you know, th those are th those are the key ones there. Um, here's on the top three property types. You may find this one interesting. So good news, James, multifamily is still the number two preferred asset behind industrial, they're kind of neck and neck. But what happened for the first time in ULI's quarter century of doing this report, hotels surpassed office and retail as the number three most desired property type to invest in. And so that's just mind boggling. I never thought I would see that, you know, that both office and retail would get knocked off their pedestal that's how bad things are in office and retail. When you think of that capital rotation, most institutional investors had about 25% of their capital in office and about 15 to 20 or 20% or more in retail. So almost half of their dollars were in retail and office. And now they're saying they want to cut that in half and they want industrial to go from 15 to 25 and they want multifamily to go from maybe 20 to 30%. So there's going to be huge capital rotation into your property type in industrial, which means the cap rate impact will probably not be as bad as it is in office and retail. So um, they, they may be willing to accept a little lower return. And remember that pension funds and insurance companies, their cost of capital has already been set. They've sold annuity products, they've sold insurance products where they may only need a 3% return on it or 4% for the next one or two years. So they can invest capital um, much cheaper you know, than say a bank or, or another entity with a different capital structure. So did you say the cap rate impact would not be so bad in the retail and office or should that be industrial and uh, multifamily? No, it's going to be really bad in office and in, in, in uh, office and retail and less severe in industrial multifamily. Okay, and the other it. thing, as you know, is in multifamily, multifamily is the only property type that has its own special capital source, which is called the GSEs, the government sponsored enterprises. Fannie, Fannie and Freddie Mac, right? So and, 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 who buys, and who buys more of those bonds than anybody? the Federal Reserve. So they're not going to let us have another housing crisis. They're going to continue to subsidize and buy those mortgage bonds. And when you look at what the Fed is selling off its balance sheet, it's not selling mortgage-backed securities. It's selling the treasuries. And that's why we're seeing the treasuries rise and the mortgage-backed stuff stay pretty stable. So um, that's a unique thing in multifamily that will cushion it just like it did in 2008 and nine. What do you think might happen to the single family housing space? So we're not going to see a crash like last time. You're going to see the rate of home price appreciation slow dramatically or go to zero because there's aren't going to be transactions. If you're in a home today and maybe you're an empty nester and you thought about selling it and moving somewhere, well, you've got a three and a half, four percent mortgage in place. And if you sell that home, now you got to go buy a new one and you're looking at seven to eight percent mortgage money. You're going to sit tight. You're going to wait and see how this goes. So existing inventory isn't going to come online. 
home builders aren't building new because they can't make the numbers work. Uh, and they know that the buyers can't afford going from, you know, a three and a half percent mortgage to a seven or eight, that's doubling the mortgage payment. So housing is just locked up. It's in a full, full out recession. But what it means is there's not going to be inventory. There's not going to be movement. There's going to be slower transaction. And that means everything backs up in multifamily. And if multifamily overprices itself in the class A side, everybody just steps down. Kind of like we used to do in office. If I was an office tenant and I hit a recession, I moved out of my class A space down to B where I could afford it. The same thing's going to happen multifamily. We're going to move from that expensive class, class A space down to B plus so value add. It has the same functionality, the same number of bedrooms, but maybe it's not as fancy. So that middle tier is where everything's going to collapse to. So if you can do the value add or secondary markets where workforce is moving, you'll do really well. I'd be very guarded against high priced uh, class A in the big gateway and urban markets, Seattle, San Francisco, New York. Um, those, those are what concern me. But if you follow where the workforce is going and the millennials and everything else, they're, they're going to the South, they're going to where there's affordability and, um, and they're going to the su suburbs for multifamily. So the suburban multifamily is, is much um, more fairly priced than say the urban, the overpriced urban stuff. But also the other point is the price of multifamily has gone up so much, most of it doesn't even qualify for GSEs, right? Fannie or Freddie, right? Or you have to get very low leverage loans. So we have to- Yeah, they're adjusting those numbers. Like they just did the single family, they adjusted it up to like 750 or 770. So the same thing will happen uh, over the time here. The real concern on multifamily, as you know, James, from your budget on your development deal. So three years ago before COVID, the median price of a single family home was around $300,000, $320,000. Um, today, that's in the 400 range. On a multifamily, the cost to build a new stick-built apartment is, a, is over $300,000. So just think about it. The cost to build a new stick-built two-bedroom apartment is what the median price was for a single family home just three years ago. So that's the, that's the big constraining factor. Can you get the rents to justify these really high construction costs? And that's why I think the, the opportunity is going to be in the existing that's a value enhancement um, that's in a secondary uh, or suburban market. So, um, so that's that. Here's the other one on investor. Anybody that plays in that is just still a fairy tale. It's going to stay strong. Uh, every comment I pulled out, you know, here, e-commerce is still holding strong. We're rebuilding our supply chain from one that was LA, Long Beach, concentric move into Chicago in the east to one that's north-south. It's using our, our upgraded Gulf Coast and East Coast ports from Savannah and Charleston and Mobile and uh, Freeport south of Houston. Demand still outpaces inventory. You know, we could double the amount of industrial e-commerce space that we're building this year. We'd go from 350 to 500 million square feet for the next two, three years and still have a 5% or lower vacancy rate. The problem is, will the banks and the capital be there to fund it? And I, I don't think they will, despite the fundamentals. The biggest issue in industrial and a lot of these property types is labor. And so the way industry solving it is with technology. We're seeing more robots in the warehouse, robotic forklifts. Um, you know, Amazon, their new e-commerce fulfillment are almost all robotic and automated. So where they promised municipalities, they'd have five or 600 jobs, try looking at 50 in the warehouse and maybe a hundred robots. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the industrial story. Um, these are their favorite markets. Uh, these were the top rated markets. So Nashville was at the top, but look at in Texas, Austin made number four. Um, and then if you look at over on the right, they break these, um, they break these markets into different uh, kind of categories uh, from kind of the, the magnet markets where the subgroups are the super sunbelt, the 18 hour. Now we don't have 24 hour. We only have 18 hour cities and then the supernovas and look at, you know, you can see Houston, you can see um, Austin, uh, you can see Dallas, the real strength in Texas. I think Texas uh, even was the only state that had more markets uh, in these top magnet markets. Florida was number two. So it just shows how strong your Texas economy, our Southern uh, markets are. You know, you've got cheap electricity, you've got workforce, uh, you, you got everything. You, you guys could exit the, uh, exit the US economy, you could have your own form of Brexit. Uh, I, I put a name on it called Flexit. Florida and Texas just exit and they take everything of economic value. So, you know, if it gets really bad, Florida and Texas will just exit and you guys can take everything with you. <laughs> so that's good news on the emerging trends. So how, the other, what's the difference between supernovas and super sunbelt and 18 hour cities? I mean, how did they categorize that? Yeah, so the supernovas are more your kind of your tech market. So Boise is a play out of Seattle. Austin is out of Silicon Valley. Um, Jacksonville, 
you know, I look at more, you know, Tampa and other parts of Florida, even Orlando is more, it should be in there. The 18 hour, these are the ones where, you know, the activity is there, people are back there, everything is functioning in the, in these cities, but they're not a gateway kind of market, a big market of, you know, 5 million or more, like in Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, Miami, you know, these are, the, these are your big, big markets um, that have affordability, they're fiscally strong, um, you know, they, they still embrace capitalism, although Denver's getting close there. I grew up in Colorado. I don't know if Denver or Colorado embraces capitalism anymore. <laughs> They're, uh, they've kind of gone the socialism route, but you know, this, the super Sun Belt, these are the mega ones where, you know, if you're trying to do a lot of deals, if you're a pension fund or you're a developer and you want to do several thousand units or several hundred units a year, you can do them in those the 18 hour cities. It gets a little more constrained. And then the supernovas, you know, you know, like in Austin, it's really tough to get something done. So that, that helps kind of uh, explain those. Um, I talk a lot about where can you outrun inflation? So if you're running seven to 9% inflation, what do you need to have to outrun it? You need to have eight, nine, 10% growth, population growth, population migration, workforce. So this is the 2020 census. And we saw the Intermountain region, Idaho, Nevada, Utah. And then we saw the whole South led by Texas and Florida. And here's what's really neat that you're gonna love because this means people can actually afford rent increases is where are the wealthiest millennial, um, not millennials, um, yeah, millennials moving, and they're moving two places, Florida and Texas. And so you can see the box there. This is shows where, this is the demographic you want. This is what you want. They can't afford a house. They've got student loan debt. They don't have a cash deposit to buy a home. They can't afford the mortgage rate. They're going to go into really highly amenitized class A multifamily. And where can you tap that? Where can you afford it? It's Texas and Florida. So this is really good news for your Texas market and, and Florida as well. This is interesting. This is on personal income growth because we have personal income growth. You can have rent increases, all the things that you need to outrun inflation. So this might surprise people that the upper Midwest, North Dakota, all the way down to Nebraska and Iowa, they actually have the strongest personal income growth. Now they're smaller, but it tells you how solid and strong that workforce is. It isn't just all a bunch of farmers and you know rural agrar agrarians. Um, you know, you get to Iowa. The number one industry in Iowa is. Um, uh, uh, is um, is tech and adaptive re adaptive re uh, engineering, um, uh, 3D printing and whatnot. So it's bigger than agriculture. But then you look at the South, look at Texas, look at Florida, look at, you know, even in Arkansas, you know, Georgia, the Carolinas, you know, Texas and Florida, you're seven and a half to nine percent personal income growth. This is where you can outrun inflation. This is where you can still have five to seven percent rent increases or maybe even higher where you can't in the rest of the country. So this is Good news for the South, good news for Texas and, and, and the Sun Belt. Um, the number one risk I talk about on retail, uh, some people may do some retail or you, you, you look at it as you're looking at housing because if you don't have retail services, you don't have very good housing. Everybody wants a grocery store, a drug store, you know, retail amenities. So this is the metric that scares the hell out of me. Oops, that was a technical economic term. <laughs> uh, it really scares the bejesus out of me. Um, core site is one of the top primary retail researchers. And they just started following a new metric, which is the cancellation rate on your carts in e-commerce. So think of all the effort you go to, to find a product, find a coupon, get all your information loaded, put your credit card information in and load it to your cart and get ready to purchase. Well, up, up through the first half of this year, the typical cancellation rate on those carts in e-commerce was about 10%. Well, what, what uh, Corsite has found is that over the summer and going into the fall, that cancellation rate has skyrocketed to 75%. Think about that. The people on e-commerce that are buying a lot of stuff, it's 75% of the time right now, they're saying, I'm so worried about layoffs. I'm so worried about inflation. I got to worry about paying the grocery bill and the rising rents that by the time I put everything into that cart, all those alarms go off in my head and I cancel it. This is the most important predictive element on retail that I think we've seen in a long, long time. And if you're doing retail, I would follow this metric uh, on Coresight. Um, they sneak it out that their data is very expensive, but they do press releases and you can you can tag this on a, on a, on a search mechanism to see. But this one scares the bejesus out of me on retail. Um, supply chain is important because our growth, our population growth, our job growth is gonna follow where our supply chain and logistics are going. And so except for California, everything is in about seven states. It's in the Midwest, like Ohio and Illinois, uh, Indiana, uh, places like Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, uh, outside Chicago. It's in Texas. 
and it's in the southeast, the states with big ports like Georgia and South Carolina and Florida. And so you can see how predominant they are. The update to this from Site Selection Magazine just came out. Ball University, Ball State University, does an annual report on logistics and where the strongest states are and where their act is together and where the investment is going and most likely to continue. So the gold is my typical golden triangle. This is where everything happens in America. That's from the Great Lakes down to Texas and all through the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic. It's where 70% of the population is, over half our GDP and 80% of all economic site selection and expansion. So it's pretty impressive. And if you look at those pink colored states with the green arrow, those are the top states for new logistics, employment centers, fulfillment, manufacturing. Um, and then the light blue is the next tier. So I, I put one there on, on Georgia, but you can see how important Texas and really the Midwest, uh, Columbus, Ohio is now taking care of New York on all its logistics supply chain. Chicago, believe it or not, is still strong. Um, and so th this is where it's really strong. This is where you see a lot more site selection uh, and new announcements by, you know, everything from auto plants to, um, you know, new manufacturing, um, all that type of stuff. So this is very interesting. This is the, my typical slide on where rail, why rail is so important. So these colored spaghetti lines are our class one railroads. We've gone from seven to six. The big new one that happened this year that was in your market was Canadian Pacific merging with Kansas City Southern. And that, that's uh, Canadian Pacific is the red and Kansas City Southern is the brown or purple going into Mexico. That created our first North American class one railroad. That is a big, big, big deal. Look for Canadian national to have to respond and probably try to pick up Norfolk Southern or um, CSX, which are the dark and light blue on the East Coast. And so you can see all the railroads move north south. And this is part of that remaking our supply chain. You know, where is the port hip bone connected to the rail leg bone connected to the interstate short haul uh, interstate foot bone? And so you can see it's really in the center of the country here. And Texas is a huge part of that. Um, my bull, my very bull market on logistics, uh, Port Freeport, south of Houston, uh, it geographically will be the largest port in North America. It's doing amazing things. Go to their websites, get to know um, uh, Phyllis Satoff, who's the director there. We only have two females running ports. One is at uh, Port Freeport and the other is Charleston, Barbara Melvin, and they are doing incredible jobs. You need to know what they're doing there. So. Um, and then here's the other story to watch this year is rail mergers. So I think we're going to see a big one from Canadian National in response to Canadian Pacific behind Kansas City Southern. Here's a Norfolk Southern one that just bought Cincinnati Southern, which was critical to their whole uh, upper Midwest supply chain. Uh, so it's a big deal. And the main reason that Cincinnati had to sell this off is they didn't have enough tax base um, in, in the fiscal situation to fund all of its other needs like rebuilding sewer and roads and bridges. So they sold the railroad to pay for infrastructure. The other one is Montana just did an acquisition with BNSF, which was a critical improvement link from all the agriculture that gets over to um, uh, Oakland and Seattle and uh, Tacoma on agriculture. So watch the rail mergers. It's gonna be a big story. Uh, here's the rail traffic, it's all down. So don't freak out. Buy the railroads right now. This is my stock tip. Especially if Canadian National steps in and makes a run at CSX or Norfolk Southern, you can see the stock double. Um, and I don't own on any of it. I have you know, all my you know, disclosures, um, whatnot. I'm not a director on any of their railroads. But look at the intermodal traffic. That's the containers and total traffic at the bottom there. Total intermodal is down almost 7%. Total traffic down almost 4%. The reason is not because of a lack of demand. It's because China isn't sending us anything. 40% of their GDP is shut down. They're 45 largest cities. So they're not sending the exports to us to go through the ports and be processed on the rail. When China opens up, you're worried about inflation. We could see inflation double if China opens up. Energy prices could go to $150 a barrel on, on energy, uh, all the commodity prices. So one of the things that, believe it or not, has been helping us on inflation, keeping it below 10% is China being shut down. China reopens. Good luck on, on inflation. We'll see 10% numbers. Um, here's where the my story, we did a paper on this uh, earlier this year. We helped um, in Alabama, the um, a New Inland Port developed in, um, Mont in Montgomery, Alabama for the Port of Mobile. The light blue dots on the bottom are the ports um, that, that can, uh, can all function. If you take the Atlanta Fed District from New Orleans all the way around to Georgia, those there are 22 ports there. And they handle more supply chain than two 
LA and Long Beach. Just think of that, more containers, more supply chain. They never had more than 10 ships backed up. They're now seeing ships back up like in Savannah, as many as 40, because the, the shippers from around the world aren't going into LA, Long Beach anymore. They're going to the Gulf and the, and the uh, South Atlantic. The yellow represent the inland waterways, which I was very bullish on until we had a drought in Mississippi almost went dry. Uh, so that kind of kills that story. But um, the light blue, that's our ports. And look at how strong from really the Gulf and the South Atlantic are really gonna be. And, and here's a mind bombing statistic. The port of New York is now the busiest container port in North America. It's knocked off LA and Long Beach. And Savannah is second at six, six and a half million containers. It will be 9 million containers, more than either LA or Long Beach ever got to within two years. They just did a big announcement this week um, where they'll go to 9 million containers. So this whole supply chain is shifting very, very quickly to North South, benefiting the Gulf and benefiting the South Atlantic. And that's, that's great news for our economies, for job growth, for population growth, for economic expansion. Um, so that's very bullish for multifamily, all those fundamentals. Um, here's some of the numbers that are looking at it where New York overtook um, LA Long Beach. Um, this is the one that uh, looks at this last week. LA and Long Beach, remember last year they had over 100 containers backed up to be unloaded? Well, last, this last month in November, they had four. That's mind boggling. And what you saw is all that shifting to Savannah and Charleston and um, Port of Mobile and Port Freeport. So this is already happening very quickly. Um, this is my favorite logistics metric to follow if you want to follow that. It's the LMI, Logistics Managers Index. It's produced by five universities and the two biggest supply chain entities. And what it says is, how healthy is logistics? And so this is telling us we're not anywhere near fixing our supply chain. So a number, you know, you look back in March, we were up to a 76 number. That's great. When you get to 50 or below, it means we're in complete collapse on supply chain. And we just hit 56. And a lot of that reason is China is not exporting. They're not manufacturing. They're not exporting. Um, it's not that our logistics infrastructure is bad. It's just we're not getting the good. So this is an important one I watch. Um, now I'm going to give you a super secret sauce data metric. It's called MWPVL. So as I was earlier this year trying to analyze the impact of Amazon overbuilding and what they were going to do with their excess warehouses, I ran across this resource, MWPVL. If you look down in the lower left, um, I've got a link there to them. And what they do is they do some of the most incredible supply chain uh, presentations. They have all of the Amazon data and they also have Walmarts and others and they make them all available in presentations like what's happening with online grocery or where Amazon's expanding or FedEx. This is the secret sauce. As you're looking at a multifamily deal, you wanna look at what's going on around you. You wanna know the neighborhood services. You wanna know what Amazon's doing. You wanna know what Home Depot or Walmart. This is a secret sauce resource and it has all the links to all their presentations. So if you wanna know the logistics impact on multifamily and, and uh, demographics, this is where you'll find it. So I'll wrap up and then we can take some questions. Uh, so this is a couple of pictures of my special needs son, Luke. He loves basketball and I'm corrupting him by teaching him pool. And what he says is, you know, it's, you know, Achieve is there to help all of your investors and your agents and, and, and clients uh, figure out what's the right commercial real estate shot going into 2023 in a recession. And so on the left, I've got my kind of top 10 things to, to really watch, to pull everything together that I just covered. Number one, unemployment, forget the job support, forget unemployment. Look at what's called the JOLTS report. It's the Job Opening Labor Turnover um, Survey. And it looks at how many openings uh, are happening versus number of unemployed. And we've been running 10 to 11 million job openings for 5 million unemployed, two to one ratio. That's gonna completely collapse. We saw it a couple of months ago drop by 1 million job openings in one month. That has to happen first before the Fed's gonna to begin to see any impact on unemployment. And then we've gotta see those layoffs translate to actual unemployed when they use up their benefits. So what the Fed wants to see, they're missing all the leading signs in the JOLTS data and the layoffs to really see that their demand destruction from rate increases is already happening. And by the time they wait for their stale data on state unemployment numbers, um, we'll be in a full out recession. Population migration, that's gonna tell you where you can outrun inflation. So I'll give you the number one thing to read after the, after the uh, uh, football games and the holidays. About the second week of January, we get the new annual moving reports from U-Haul and United Van Lines. And they tell us where everybody moved the prior year. And they've been moving just like that census data that I showed you. They're moving inland and south towards affordability and where there's jobs. That's the south, it's Texas, it's Florida, it's the Carolinas, it's Tennessee. Look for that the, the second week of January. 
the confidence measures. A lot of what drives our economy is psychological. If the consumer is in the doldrums, if small business is in the doldrums, and housing's in recession, it's hard to have a positive economy. All three of those, those, those confidence measures are near or at record low numbers, breaking even back to the 1980s. Um, look at earnings. Look at the earnings of the key tech and manufacturing companies in your geography, in your city, in your state. They will tell you what's happening the next six months. They have to do it under penalty of perjury to the SEC. So when I look at earnings reports by public REITs or I look at you know a Prologis or I look at the retailers, they're telling me everything that's gonna happen the next six months, how many stores are gonna close, how many warehouses they're gonna build, what they're worried about on layoffs. So those are really, really important. Read this Emerging Trends 2023 report. It is their single best one in a quarter century. It is chock full of great information that I tried to cover a little bit of. Look at the CPPI metrics. They're foretelling you what's gonna happen on valuations. All that we've seen so far is the impact of expenses growing faster than rent growth. What comes next is the cap rate reconciliation from seven, eight, nine interest rate increases. That hasn't even played out yet. That comes next year. Uh, the CREPI index, it's free. We produce it. We tell you what it means. It's 10 forward looking metrics. We give you all the data. We give you the Excel workbook. We give you all the history. It's really been predictive and accurate. When we went back 25 years, we never missed a downturn or recovery by one quarter. So it's pretty predictive. Pay attention if you're in the Western markets to this Colorado River Basin water drought and the curtailment in water usage in the seven states, except for California. Um, you know, Coresight, that cancellation rate in your carts is very predictive of what the consumer's doing on, on online retail. And then that MWPVL is just incredible on, on the things you want to look at about Amazon. The other three I would tell you to look at is pay attention to the, Ch the China COVID and its responses. So China now has more COVID cases and increases than it ever did, more than 2020 or 2021. They're seeing rioting in, in, the, in their public resistance to even more onerous lockdowns. So China's in a real state of turmoil and I don't think the manufacturing resumes to help us on supply chain. Remaking our supply chain is gonna take us two or three years to go from LA and Long Beach to Chicago to more north south, um, but we can do it pretty quickly and it's happening. And the last one is pay attention to real rail mergers. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. This is, uh, I'll give you one last piece. My favorite economists are, are Yogi Bear and Jimmy Buffett. So Jimmy Buffett, a uh, couple of his album covers here, I can't substitute Fed for wind in this album cover. I can't change the direction of the Fed, but I can adjust my sales to always reach my destination. That's what you're trying to help your investors and your agents and your clients, James, is help them adjust the direction of their sales. How do I do transactions in a recession? How do I uh, deal with sellers and buyers that are so far apart? Um, the other one is it's going to be tough. So at times you're just going to have to breathe in, breathe out and try to move on. But I love Yogi Berra. You know, what he said is, you know, you can observe a lot by just watching, watching your webinars, watching your, your data and information. You're bringing that information, that real time from real industry people to help them figure out what I need to do. So just pay attention to Yogi Bear and Jimmy Buffett. They were, they're the best economists that, that I follow. And then here's a little bit about our, about our company. So with that, I'll stop and see if we have any questions. Yeah, I mean, we have tons of questions. One of the easiest questions is, will this recording be available? Yes, uh, we'll do that because that has a multiple questions. So am, are we able to share uh, the slides with the attendees on the Absolutely. PDF format? Okay, yep. good. so that's an answer another question. So one of the other questions, Blackstone is seeing a lot of re redemption. Is this proxy for private real estate like syndications? Will this be a dominoes effect? So it's a tip of the iceberg. So we also saw Starwood REIT today announce that they're halting redemptions as well. And what it's showing, Starwood is a um, non-publicly traded REIT. Um, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing the cracks in the capital availability. So if you even can't get your money out of a REIT, you're in real, in real trouble. And so they can't even get capitalization out of their bank relationships or getting more investors in to backfill what's being pulled out because people are panicking. And so it's a it's a symptom that's showing, um, you know, what we've got ahead of us, which is this capital lockup. So you've got so this really started in Europe and UK almost a month ago, and I warned people about it in a LinkedIn post, and everybody thought I was being dramatic and and uh, and that I was crazy. And I said, yeah, I know I'm crazy, but I'm right. <laughs> and so here now, a month later, we've got Blackstone, and now we've got Starwood Reed, the S Reed. We've got more of this coming. And uh, 
what, one of the lessons I learned when I was on a board of director on uh, UMH REIT and industrial REIT, and now I'm not on their manufactured housing uh, UMH um, REIT, was that the founding uh, principal, the dad, who's 83 and still very active, he said, you've got to have multiple uh, tiers uh, in your capital stack. So one of the things that um, Monmouth got criticized for was that they had a, um, you know, about five to 10 percent of their total assets in securities, high quality, you know, REITs or other REITs or whatnot. And they got criticized for that. And the, and the dad reminded them that in periods of illiquidity, you can sell those equities really quickly, 24 hours, and you can capitalize the, a need or a capital call or a redemption. And uh, we're going to relearn capital structure lessons all over again in this cycle. And uh, Eugene Landy, uh, his sons, uh, Mike, who ran uh, Monmouth, and his son, Sam, that runs uh, UMH with his dad today, they taught us the right lessons and they're worth going back and looking at. So I think it's a tip of the iceberg on the capital headwinds that we face in our industry. We're a very capital intensive industry. And if capital gets choked off and the Fed tells the banks not to lend because it's inflationary, the Fed is missing a very important lesson here, which is you destroy real estate. Yeah. So let's, let me ask you more questions. What happens to all the multifamily properties that bought earlier this year, second half of last year with floating rate debt, hearing a lot of distressed sales will hit the market next year. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Not going to happen because what we're, what we're going to see, it's very different that the banks and even the GSEs learned from, from COVID was that when a bank puts together a workout department to take all these assets back in, one third of the total losses they incur are the cost of setting up and operating an REO or workout program. So they realize it's better to bundle those bad loans and toss them to private equity to figure out. And that's what they did with the hotel loans in 2021. They didn't work them out. They just bundled them and they sold the loans to private equity and and, and said, you know, if, if, if I'm going to lose one third more by setting up a workout department, I have a lot more room that I can discount and I can immediately get rid of the problem and not have lingering costs and impacts on my capital. So that's the model the banks have learned that they're going to follow. That is, if there is distress, they're going to bundle them, they're going to put them in grab bags and they're going to toss them to private equity to work out. And we won't see that distress like we have in prior cycles. Uh, it's a lesson learned. Um, so I wouldn't be looking for that in the banks. They're not going to go that path this time. Yeah, I think the question was more like on the syndicator side, right? So will the syndicator lose the property when when uh, their breach debt become uh, too expensive or they can't exit from their breach debt, right? Because a lot of them have three three years terms, right? And then plus one, yeah. plus one is optional. So do you have, they, have they, you heard about might. that? Hmm? Yeah, they might. And it's an opportunity to step in. You know, here's where, again, what you teach people, James, which is before all this stuff happens, get prepared. Know your market, know your submarkets, know where you will go and not go. Know that, you know, am I am I willing to go if I want to buy the thing at a 40 or 50 percent haircut? Am I willing to do 25 or 30? Because if I do the replacement cost numbers, you know, the syndicator and whatnot is going to say, look, at I'm going to look at replacement costs. And the next one of these to replace is going to be even more expensive. I'm not going to a 40 percent haircut, but I might go to a a 20 or 25 percent. So you got to do your homework and know your markets and know your sub markets. And if you're not doing replacement costs and having that number in front of you to balance out the offers, um, you're doing yourself a disservice because the principle of substitution, remember that old principle, you know, we got anticipation, what I'm going to make and substitution. Should I build or should I invest in existing? You need to be answering that question right now. And in most cases, I think I'm not going to build. It's too expensive. Um, it's too hard to make the numbers work, but if I can buy existing or there's syndicated deals that are falling apart, I can buy those a lot less than replacement costs. I might want to be ready, but you got to be ready. You got to know your market, sub-market and your numbers and where you're going to go. So the other question is on Phoenix. I mean, the cap rates were 3% earlier this year. I mean, uh, do you think what, I mean, what would happen to the cap rates of multifamily there? Because that's, I mean, I, I think in general, that's probably more of a Colorado uh, lower basin question, right? Do you think that's going to impact there? So here's the thing. If you can't build a new one because you can't get a permit, you don't have the water, existing is going to become very valuable. Mm -hmm. But then the other question is, in the existing, how much job loss is there? So if I'm a bottling company or I'm a chip manufacturing, people don't realize that a chip manufacturing plant 
like in the desert. It uses a <laughs> lot of water. <laughs> yeah, the equivalent of 80, a city of 80,000 people. So oh, I get yeah. calls every week right now from people that are companies that are looking at bottling plants, chip manufacturing, heavy water usage uh, companies that are saying, I'm willing to walk from a $100 million facility and I need to set a new one up in the South where there's water. And so it's a two tier thing. One, I'm not gonna have new competition, that's good. But two, if I have a lot of job loss, that, that offsets that advantage um, in what, what happens um, you know, if I have a lot of job loss. So I'm really worried about Phoenix and Las Vegas and Denver, you know, uh, New Mexico. I, I just don't see the economic development continuing because of this water issue. And it's not just water, it's electricity. So Las Vegas gets 80% of its electricity from hydroelectric. What happens when that shuts off and there's nothing being generated in Lake Powell and Lake Mead? That's a pretty serious problem. And you start having rolling blackouts in the first and second quarter next year in Phoenix and Las Vegas because no electricity. That sure shuts down industry. Yeah. yeah. So any thoughts on Class A in Florida or Dallas? Uh, will that be impacted? So... Um, you know, Dallas, you know, people forget Texas has some of its own water issues, but it has a great electric grid and it, it's own electricity, very affordable. Uh, it's done strategic things to make sure it has water. Florida, you know, we've had it hit again by hurricanes. So the Florida economy is going to boom because you got to rebuild so much from Hurricane, Hurricane Ian. Um, and then, then the later, heck, there's another late one that's coming right now is I got to go to Fort Lauderdale tomorrow. <laughs> I was looking at the weather alerts for, you know, it's hurricane season supposed to end November one. And, uh, and here we are December, December past yeah. December one with a storm. So I think Florida is a huge rebuilding story. I think in Florida, the pressures are going to be on costs that until we rebuild. And this is, you know, when you look at from uh, Siesta Key, South of Sarasota, all the way down to Naples, I mean, you're looking at something that never happened again. You're looking at multi, multi-year, kind of rebuilding. And so that's caused population to scatter. My daughter was in Sarasota. She relocated to Tallahassee because they couldn't find or afford um, housing there. So you're going to see a lot of dislocation that's going to drive demand and rents up in Florida. Plus, you still have the migration coming to Florida. So that's why those moving reports will be very important. I think Texas is going to continue to see just mind-boggling numbers from the moving reports. Um, so I think things will be, be be fine there. I just worry, can you make new construction numbers work in big markets like Dallas? Got it. Although the insurance really went up after the hurricane end, right? So it my did. insurance almost went up like 100,000 within one month. And the reason was hurricane Ian. Right? So even yeah, though I'm in Texas. You, and then your deductible goes up too. So, and then you got to not have gap. You got to have wind and flood. And so the wind is almost more expensive than the flood. So you're mm -hmm. almost are running uninsured when you have a 50 to 100,000 per unit deductible. And then you have this insane premium, uh, you know, that could take your operating costs from, you know, 35% to over 50% just because of the insurance impact. And then you got the tax assessor coming in for his bite of the apple. Yep. What's your thoughts on build to rent concept? On which? Build to rent, BTR concept. So single, on the subject, single family rentals or townhome rentals. It's dead. Um, what's happened is that private equity is pulled out of it because they don't think the numbers work. So you look at American Homes for Rent as an example. Um, the model that they needed to build houses and rent them is broken. And so they mm. pulled out, quit buying the houses. The private equity is pulled out of their capital. It makes sense because if I can't buy a house and I outgrow an apartment, I got married, I have a kid, and I need to be in the school district, the for rent single family works, um, but the economics don't work anymore. So it's fallen out. I think we're gonna have to look at other affordable housing options like manufactured housing. Uh, so I'm on a re uh, UMH and uh, we, can, we can put in place with the lot in a new 1400 square foot trailer, or I can't say trailer, manufactured home uh, for 120 to $140,000. And we just got the first Fannie Mae facilities for our, for our projects that are offering four and a half percent fixed money. So now you can be in a manufactured home in a really nice community with amenities. These are like five star, you swear to God, you're in a subdivision that are near factories or near the suburbs. And my rent payment or my mortgage payment's like 900 bucks or my rent is under a thousand. Um, we have got to rethink density and product type to get affordable housing. I love the for rent model, but it's broken. It's private equity's pulled its, its, its carpet and gone somewhere else.
Is it because of the mortgage rate is too high or? It's both. It... Costs are broken, the mortgage, the, the construction costs, all the elements. You, you now, have, you got to spend four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand dollars $450,000 to build a house and the market will only rent it, assuming it's worth about 300000 So you got a big gap there. They can't pay, you know, uh, 1800 to $2,800 in rent uh, on a bill, on a four, on a, a four rent single family. Um, that's the problem. The, the numbers just don't work anymore. Got it. Got it. So uh, beyond this forecast, do you sign up monthly, monthly reports or updates? I mean, people don't know how do you subscribe to your, you know, <laughs> to your emails? Yeah, so we're, we, we're nice people. So if you go to our website, www.redshoeeconomics.com, um, and you go to the, the media or the events tab at the top, every one of my presentations are there. And then I post a lot each week on LinkedIn. So follow us on LinkedIn. Everything that's relevant on each of the property types of the economy or the jobs report or CPI or the Fed, I post probably five to seven things. And they're not just here's the article and here's that. I actually put the context, you know, there's a full paragraph there explaining it. I give you the cliff notes. So either follow us on LinkedIn or you can go to our website and every presentation I do every week, uh, we update and put them on there. And so they're free. We make them free. Uh, so at some point we got to monetize it. We're a small business, but right now it's it's all free. You can just go to either our website uh, or follow us on LinkedIn. 